Hey, hello everyone. I am JJ, your mentor and I am passionate about teaching and that is why I'm here and I want to make a change, a big change but with you guys. So yes, you can see that I changed the background. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about this change. I want a change in the way you learn and in the way you see the world. Well, I'm not sure about the second thing, but yeah, I'll try. So we are into part three of our pop tosses. So yes, hooray, part three. That means we have completed two parts in which we have come across what is a pop tosses and whether there is some other process which is like a pop tosses. Is there some other process like that? You know the answer, right? And now the third portion is, do you know what are the different pathways of a pop tosses? Well, do you? If you don't know, we will learn it today, right now. There are two different pathways that is extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway. Extrinsic pathway as the name suggests is for external signals such as growth hormones. Okay, and intrinsic pathway is for internal signals such as when there's a DNA damage or you have a damaged organelle or when there's low amount of oxygen and nutrients. Okay. But these pathways are dependent on something else that is caspase. They are caspase dependent. So we as humans are dependent upon a lot of things such as we are dependent upon our parents, our teachers, our friends, colleagues and like that. And because they make our life easy, right? So these caspases are also responsible for making these pathways easy. Okay, they help in the working of pathways which lead to apoptosis. So we should know what is caspase before we get into the major topic. Right, so caspases are protease. Protease means is an enzyme which cleaves or breaks down proteins. So this is a protein. Okay, this whole structure is a protein. It is formed of uh, different amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids and they come in different combination and form a protein. And this protease enzyme that is caspase is uh, somewhat special and we'll learn why. Okay, so the full form of caspase is cysteine dependent aspartate specific protease so oh my god do i need to mark this up the answer is no we will break this down and we will learn and understand okay so it is cysteine dependent look all enzymes have a catalytic unit okay so this particular caspase enzyme it has a catalytic unit where cysteine is present cysteine is an amino acid so cysteine is present in its catalytic unit and the second part that is it is aspartate specific so if i'm a caspase i'll search for aspartate first okay so this is leucine this is cyrus where is my aspartate oh, okay i found my aspartate now when i found my aspartate i will cut it at the c terminal i will not cut at the n terminal but at the c terminal that is uh, amino acids they have uh, n terminals and c terminals that is amino terminal and carboxyl terminal so this particular protease it cuts at the c terminal of aspartate and that's why it is known as aspartate specific proteases okay so now we know what this means that is cysteine dependent because it is dependent upon cysteine because cysteine is present at the catalytic unit and it is aspartate specific because it cleaves at the C terminal of aspartate residue. Okay, that's how we learn the full form of caspases. Now, there is one more thing that is, these caspases are usually found inside our body in the form of inactive procaspases. So, the inactive form is known as procaspases and they need to undergo cleavage to form active caspases. We'll see how right now. So this is procaspase 1 and this is procaspase 2. And then there's another thing that is adapter protein. Adapter protein and procaspases are best friends. You may ask why. I'll tell you two reasons. Okay. Adapter proteins helps for recruitment of procaspases in the signaling pathway. That is, they themselves get attached to something. Okay. And uh, after that, these procaspases attach to the adapter protein. And that's how they are. these caspases are recruited in the pathway. And the second thing is that because of adapter protein, two such pro caspases can come together and only when they come together they can undergo cleavage so yes they have two functions for attaching to the adapter protein they need a domain that is known as prodomain so the green portion you see is known as prodomain with the help of which it attaches to the adapter protein okay and then this blue portion you see is a large subunit and the small subunit is here in the yellow color Okay, so now these two procaspases are in close proximity, so that's why they cleave at two different sites. There are two sites of cleavage, so they now undergo cleavage, and uh, now you can see that prodomains are saying bye bye, they are free right now, they are happy. Yeah, so now we are left with large subunit and small subunit. Two such large subunit and small subunit come together and form a heterodimer dimer because there are two units. Okay, similarly, uh, caspase 2 also forms a heterodimer with its large subunit and small subunit. Sadly, they are still inactive okay so for becoming active they both need to come together 
and uh, form a tetramer tetramer because there are four subunits okay so now they are they are a tetramer and this tetramer is the active form okay so the active form is a tetramer and these caspases further goes and cleaves other caspases and makes them active now they don't need to get attached to the adapter protein the other caspases are activated with the help of these active caspases okay and uh, we will understand it in a better way if we know the classification okay so there are basically three different classes that is inflammation caspases which are uh, present where inflammation is there okay these caspases run to the uh, sites where inflammation is present okay and the second thing is initiator caspases so initiator caspases are the first ones to come and attach to the adapter protein that's why this is known as initiator caspases because they are initiating an activity and these initiator caspases cleaves executional caspases okay so imagine them to be uh, friends they help each other um, to become active not each other actually initiator caspases helps executional caspases to become active by cleaving them and these executional caspases further cleave other such executional caspases so that they become a, they can become a huge crowd this helps in their functioning okay so these executional executional caspases they cleave other executional caspases and also certain target proteins these target proteins are the ones which maintain the structure of the cell so if these target proteins are cleaved will the cell be able to maintain its structure the answer is no and that's how apoptosis occurs okay so it's important to know the numbers uh, and that is which number belongs to which team or which class okay so i have put it in a staircase manner so that it would be easy for you to learn so let's begin First, we have to go downstairs okay so there's one and two and three then we'll jump back like this and we'll go four and five then jump back again it's six and seven and in the middle it's eight nine and ten and that's how we learn the numbering right it's a very easy process yeah so one two and three jump four and five then jump back six and seven and in the middle it's eight nine and ten yay we have learned that so now as we have learned that we should stop breathe and revise so revise go and revise what you have learned right now because revision is necessary trust me oh i use the word trust me a lot so forgive me but yeah trust me <laughs> and then we will see the target proteins which on which caspases acts okay so these are the target proteins there are many actually but there are three number which are main so first is nuclear lamin proteins nuclear lamin proteins are responsible for the formation of nuclear lamina which is a layer which is present beneath the nuclear membrane okay so nuclear this is a nuclear membrane beneath the nuclear membrane it's a nuclear lamina layer present so if these proteins are cleaved nuclear lamina won't be formed and hence uh, the structure of the nucleus won't be maintained yeah and now the second proteins are those which hold the endonucleases endonucleases are enzymes which uh, are responsible for the cleavage of dna or fragmentation of dna so in usual case we don't want our nuclear sorry our dna to get fragmented or it's deadly right so these proteins holds these endonucleases and say you guys you should stop there you should not uh, cleave our dna we have to live more okay but during apoptosis our cell doesn't want to live it did get its it get killed okay so these proteins are cleaved so endonucleases are now free and as they are free they go and do dna fragmentation and, and that's how it works okay and the third protein is cytoskeleton protein cytoskeletal proteins are those proteins which provides the structure to the cell so if these cytoskeleton proteins are cleaved there won't be a proper structure that is the structure of the cell will be lost and that's how apoptosis occurs right so yes uh, that's all about it Thank you from the bottom of my heart for bearing with me and watching my video. If you like this video, please don't forget to, to give a thumbs up and also share and subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. It matters. Yeah. So yes, I hope you're all having a good day today. If you're not, I wish that you have a very good day. Much love. Bye from JJ.